there are many, many teachers and teachings that offer power, special powers. And like everything, they have their place. Everything that is has its place. But I just want to be very clear with you that that's not what this is. That's not what this invitation is. It is not an invitation to higher and greater powers. You have to really let that sink in. Because often no matter what we say it is we want, what it is we really want is power. More power, of, which is control. The truth is all power has to be surrendered in the end. And the invitation of this teaching is to face the end now. The result of that facing can give rise to latent powers. But if they are followed and if they are worshipped and if they are reached for, then as you have seen in yourself and in the world, megalomania, delusion, misery. I'm not suggesting that you follow and reach for powerlessness either, which also arises and has arisen in your life, and you're also familiar with that. To follow that, to reach for that, is a, a false humility and a, a kind of negative megalomania, misery, suffering. It's possible to not touch either powerlessness or powerfulness. It's possible to surrender them both. And that possibility I really bring to you from my teacher. There's a time in the evolution of a form where kind of coming up out of the muck. There's a realization of the power of mind and a shift from muckness <laughs> to, to rising above that specialness. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually quite beautiful play. It's, it's uh, like, like adolescence in that realm. It's, adolescence is a coming out of the sort of unconscious, sometimes bliss, sometimes misery, but generally unconscious era of childhood into a time of power, a recognition of power internally and in the power of possibility of the power over and strength. And it's infatuating. It's intoxicating. And in general, especially in our culture, there is a strong possibility of fixating there and just wanting more of that, kind of more adolescence, more sexual power, more power over, more strength, more beauty. And there can be levels of success in that. But that's not what this teaching is. The powers that you have accumulated are still not giving you what you are yearning for. Most of human endeavor is the attempt to keep what will be lost. Right? Everyone must be very familiar with that. <laughs> the attempt to keep pleasure, attempt to keep youth, attempt to keep health, attempt to keep understanding, attempt to keep power, attempt to keep lovers, attempt to keep ecstasy, of course, with that, there's the attempt to keep away 
the opposite. But in that spinning and that uh, mind activity to keep what is subject to loss, there is huge suffering. There's minor suffering and there's huge suffering. But that's basically what suffering is. They attempt to keep what will be lost. Of course, finally being this particular life form. This death to the life form. The attempt to keep that away, to keep eternal life. And then, of course, we get into the spiritual realm and all of the yogic powers that can be acquired so that you get to keep eternal life. But if eternal life is something that can be lost, it's not eternal life. Just logically, it's not eternal life. So if for our purposes we first of all see what it is we are trying to keep or what it is we are afraid to lose, we can meet this force, which is fear of losing, this force that drives the strategies of the mind, that drives the thoughts, the engine that drives the thoughts. I have the hope that if we find some way to keep what is usually lost, it won't be lost in this case. You are here in this room, obviously, because there is some degree of direct understanding of maturity or ripening where you recognize the futility of that, where you have had moments of great pleasure great ecstasy, great understanding, great youth, great health, great lovers, great power, and it's been lost. <laughs> and then the search begins to get the great, the greatest that won't be lost. And we meet. This is how I met my teacher. I finally recognized that all of my accomplishments, all of my powers were all subject to loss. And that that recognition was the basis of my suffering. That there had to be some level of maintaining what it is I thought I had and striving to get what it is I hoped I could get and working diligently to keep away what I thought would take away what it was I had. This takes a lot of attention. It's surprising how much attention it takes because a lot of it's just going on subconsciously. Just working it, figuring it, keeping it all in place, monitoring it, evaluating it, ranking it, judging it over and over and over, day and night. And the tragedy in this is what gets overlooked <laughs> is what's already eternal, what already cannot be lost, what is already here. Y you've heard the words, you know the words, that is who you are. Silence is always here. Awareness is always here. And you have experienced at least glimpses of the truth of that. But a glimpse also can be lost because it's an experience, meaning it appears, it exists for some time, and it disappears. And then the scramble begins to get either that experience back or another better, bigger experience. It's too big to be lost. I'm not just speaking for myself, am I? I mean, is this a pretty common experience? <laughs> That's disillusionment. And it is very necessary. It's what allows the maturing of the soul maturing of the mind stream. 
so that there can be some willingness and there can actually be some fortitude to tell the truth. And the truth is ruthless and relentless. And the truth is, you will lose your body. You will lose your youth. You will lose your pleasure. You will lose your health. We, you will lose your lovers, your husband, your children, your wife, your understanding. You will lose everything. There's this, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> so, but just for our purposes, <laughs> if let's assume that you will, that it will all be lost, that at some point, unknown in time, this lifetime, this life stream comes to an end. And with that, all the relationships of this life stream as they have appeared, all of the experiences, all of the defeats, all of the victories, all of the maneuverings, all of the accumulations, all of the attainments, everything, gone. That's true for everyone. It is, has been in the past a great rarity when someone steps forth and speaks of what cannot be lost, what is eternal, what is always here, what is already immortal life, what is already the truth of who I am. And we, of course, revere and bow to these great rare beings who appeared in the past to speak the truth. And many were reviled and hated and ostracized and burned and many were adored and worshipped and followed. But in general, all were misunderstood because they were understood based on the hope that if I get something, if I get what this great being is saying, if me, if I get it, then I will have what that great being has, and that can never be taken away from me. That will be irrevocable. But if for a, a moment, a, a weekend, you experience losing everything, really losing everything, as Ramana experienced facing death, and in that experience you tell the truth of what is always present, the radical truth, the root of truth, of what is always present. Then you will read these great teachers, these great sages, these saints, these holy people, very differently. You will understand directly what is being pointed to. You understand the scriptures and the sutras as the overflowing of your own experience not as something for you to get, or remember, or work toward, but as the song of what is eternally present. This is present for you now. You have the capacity to realize this because you are this that realizes itself. What was rare in the past needn't be rare now. And it is a horrible superstition to believe that since it was rare, it must still be rare. And this superstition is a thought form that keeps your mind encased in denying or overlooking the immortality that is present in this moment and always that your form appears in, that your form disappears in, your form, and that you remain as, 
that your personality appears and disappears in, that your character traits appear and disappear in, that your destiny appears and disappears in, then you will understand also that this you, this your, which is really perfect in the English language, I don't know if it works in other languages as well, is both singular and plural. It's both one and all. So that you will recognize that all form is your form appearing in you. All emotions are your emotions appearing in you. All phenomena is your phenomena appearing and disappearing in you. And the attention and the energy and the time that has been spent trying to get something is released, is set free. This freedom then can be used to explore deeper. To Your mind then can be used to explore deeper the endlessness of this that is eternal life, this that is already presently immortal, presently here. And this is why we have met. This is why we have come together. So this is not just another teaching where you can accumulate power. It's very important that you recognize that so that you don't waste time using this teaching to accumulate power. Great power may come, but it also may go. <laughs> let it come, let it go. There are great powers that appear in your life all the time. Just naturally, power is one of the aspects of mind. But it is just an aspect of mind. The power that gives rise to the power. The power that dissolves all power is immortal beingness, immortal consciousness that is already here. The mind is an awesome power. It's a beautiful power. And the, the main focus of its power is to possess. That's how learning takes place. You possess, you know, you work, you work, you work, and then you learn something and it's possessed in the mind. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. That's how learning can work. And learning is awesome. And the mind must be used in this possessing function for much learning. I mean, it facilitates the great arts, it facilitates the great discoveries. It facilitates the capacity to design and build a house, or a dress, or a meal. This is beautiful. But where it can't go, what it can't possess, is the source of its own power. It is the greatest power of possession but its source it cannot possess. So once the attention of an individual lifetime is mysteriously and sacredly turned toward reunion with God or truth or self, the mind is only in the way. Perhaps it takes lifetimes of discovering that because we are in love with this power of mind and we don't want to believe that there's some place it can't go. We don't want to even consider that we may have to let go to have everything, to give up everything, to have truth. 
Not that we possess truth, that would be the mind's idea, <laughs> but so that truth claims its possession, which is us, each soul, each being. So when Papaji says, call off the search, or Ramana says, be still, or Gangaji says, stop making excuses, <laughs> It's simply pointing to the fact that once again you are trying to get something, which you've been trained to do, with the faculties of your mind, with the thinking power, with the projecting power, with the imagining power, with the discriminating power, with the veiling power. If you will stop, if you will for an instant, it only takes an instant, just give up that power. I understand the fright that that evokes, the fear of being brainwashed, but you are brainwashed. <laughs> you already are brainwashed. So the fear of being further brainwashed, <laughs> the fear of turning into an idiot, of your true deep dark evil self coming to the surface, of going crazy of losing it, of never being able to find yourself again. But you have lost yourself. You are crazy. You act like idiots. <laughs> really? I have this friend who's a teacher, and she was saying, she just looks at it as students and she says, my God, they're all enlightened, they're all enlightened. And then they open their mouths. <laughs> because the, the beauty and truth that we call enlightenment is shining from every eye. Shining. And then the mouth opens and the, the mind comes forth and it's like, oh, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> so what this one prisoner wrote, just the, the moment of simply being, without being anybody, without being anything, without getting it right, without missing it, without naming it, without knowing it, just being. This is the moment of awakening. And the truth is, everyone has those moments every day. But it goes overlooked. Each moment goes overlooked because of our infatuation with this power of mind. And mind is not present in any of those moments. And then mind arises and we get on with the business or we get on with the definition or who's wronged us or who's righted us or who we have to get or keep or what we have to know. And then all of a sudden there's a moment just being, not needing anything, not wanting anything, not knowing anything and yet being known. So it must be cut, and to be cut it must first be seen, is this infatuation with mind, this infatuation with this beautiful power, this beautiful angel, well, devil sometimes, but the infatuation with the byproduct of the source rather than the source itself. This is for each one to tell the truth, to examine. In telling the truth, mind is exposed, mind is busted. In lying, mind stays in power. When mind is exposed or busted, it's actually quite this happiness. Because the power of mind is a perfect divine servant to truth, a happy servant to truth. 
so that the the intellectual capacity of an individual or the life experiences of an individual or the artistic capacity of an individual can all be used as servant to truth happily joyfully when it's used in servant in service to itself is mind it's called ego and there's suffering there's pleasure it's a kind of pleasure arrogant pleasure of boy I did it but there's huge suffering and it's unnecessary suffering because who you think you are who you think did it doesn't even exist that's a thought it's all it is and it has power because you bow to that thought you practice that thought daily it's your spiritual practice you say you have a guru, you say you have a spiritual practice, but your real practice, the one that happens the rest of the 23 hours of the day, is bowing to this thought of who you are and collecting other thoughts to support that and augment that and perfect that. It's a thought. And when it is examined fully, with the question, who am I? It is discovered to be nothing. Who you think you are is nothing. It doesn't exist. Who you think you are <laughs> does not exist. It's imagined. It's put together with a string of thoughts and some help from parents and teachers and friends, and TV and movies. You check it out. It's not, this is not new. I'm not making this up. You check it out. You ask the question, who am I really? You examine, you investigate this I thought and see what validity it really finally has. And in that examination, the radiance that you are sees itself. The only obstacle, the only obstacle to realizing the truth of who you are is thinking who you are. It's really that simple. The only obstacle to realizing the truth of who you are is thinking who you are. Really, really. Everything that uh, we do in here, everything that is said in here, is to cut that thought process which is very strong, as you know. But its strength, the thoughts of who you are, its strength is based on two powers of mind, the power of memory and the power of projection into the future. So the power of remembering the past and the power of projecting into the future. That's what generates or creates the present thought of who you are. So this is a very big power and it is a glorious power. There's nothing wrong with memories of the past. There's nothing wrong with projecting in the future. It's part of the play of God. But the danger is in this play of God, overlooking God. Being so fascinated by God's fabrications and the permutations of those fabrications 
that God itself is overlooked. And then a suffering appears and a yearning to alleviate that suffering, a yearning to reconnect with the truth of God, with the source of mind, the source of mind's powers. It's really that simple. You have a choice to either continue chasing some better particular image or surrendering to the truth that is imageless and yet inseparable from any image. This is a very important half. The formless truth of who you are is inseparable from any formulation of who you are. So right now, in this present, which is for most people just an accumulation of past images shifting around, right now the formless truth of who you are is just as present as when this body is dead and all those images are finished. Dust. Bit the dust. The great and thrilling opportunity is to realize yourself as the formless truth before the form naturally dies. That's why we are meeting like this. Many of you will realize this. Many of you have realized this. Some it will take until one is on the deathbed. Even in that moment, if you can realize the formless presence that has been inseparable, from every moment of your life, then your life will have been lived in glory of that. And your fulfillment will be a testimony to the world. So while these thoughts of yourselves, of yourself, Selves, while these thoughts of yourselves is the only obstacle, they're also no problem. Because you as consciousness has the capacity to see through any obstacle. You are the seeing itself. You have full and absolute capacity to know yourself, to be true to yourself, and to be tested in this knowing and this truth. And in that testing, to discover and know yourself always deeper, fresher. My mind has all the right answers, but my heart is aching and tortured. I know the experience is that, but it's just the opposite. Your heart has all the answers and it's your mind that is aching and tortured. Because your mind is trying to be your heart. It's trying to do your heart. And the mind can't do the heart. I mean, it can do some imitations of the heart. <laughs> I love you! <laughs> but it can't do the heart. And it is... Uh, split into doing the heart and judging the doing of the heart. And the judge of the doing of the heart is saying, you're failing, you're failing. You're, and beating and torturing and whipping, you're worthless, you're poisonous, you're toxic. You're so then in a moment of stop trying to do lovability or 
non-toxibility. Just, just stopping it all, this moment. Without knowing whether I love you or not. Without ever knowing that, because that's also in the mind. It's also in the mind. So no matter how many times I would say, I love you, I love you, I see your beauty, I do see everything. So I see who you are, and that is lovable. So forget that, we're not talking about that right now. Because if the mind takes that, it tries to find what it is that is seen as beautiful and lovable, and it can't find it because it's not there. It can find pictures and images and memories of times when you actually felt when there was an alignment with feeling and, and heart. But that comes and goes. So the ruthlessness of this invitation, whether it is regarding discovering love, discovering enlightenment, discovering freedom, discovering truth, discovering yourself, is to recognize the mind cannot deliver it. It is unknowable. That's, that's the essential understanding from the mind. That's the humbling of the mind. That's really surrender. Coming in from the mental door. And there's this hope because there has been success in knowing many things. And you've just persevered, you just worked at it hard enough, you succeeded. But this is the opposite of that. The perseverance here is in giving up the hope that the mind can deliver the heart, which is love. giving up the hope that the mind can deliver enlightenment, which is truth, the truth of who you already are. That the mind can deliver freedom. And in giving up that hope, really stopping searching. It's not giving it up and <laughs> it's like, okay, just as it was set up here, okay, I'll die then, okay, I'll never know then, okay, I will never be enlightened then. Oh, what a burden is lifted immediately. Do you feel it? You want to come up? I just... I've realized how much of my life has been spent hiding mm. and really being afraid to mm. be out socially somehow. I conspired to have a lot of time taking care of people and being by myself and, and ultimately I didn't realize, I think until this, I was realizing since oh hi how much I was afraid to be seen. To be loved. Yeah, being loved usually has a bad ending. What's the ending of being loved? Getting hurt. <laughs> Lots of those, you know. Well, heartbreak. So you, you asked me in your letter, that can you hurt me? Of course. You can break my heart. Hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. Let's make this very clear right now. This is not about escaping hurt. This is about the willingness to bear the hurt of the whole universe. in service of love. Yes, it hurts. And the isolation is sometimes an attempt to escape that hurt. It's a strategy, appropriate at certain times. Maybe as a child with your mother. Certainly all of us have that power to, to withdraw somewhat. This really as in all the teachings, really, that I have seen, the final awakening requires that you surrender all your powers. Because all your powers are the powers of doingness. 
you do withdrawal, you do closing down, you do storytelling of suffering or self-aggrandizement. So we have the capacity to hurt one another. Did you, have you recognized that in your life? <laughs> we have that capacity, we have that power. We have the capacity to be hurt. And with those is the capacity to love and be loved. That's the price. So if you don't want to be hurt and you, you will give anything to not be hurt, then you will give up your capacity to love and be loved. It's very simple because that's giving up the capacity to recognize yourself as love. Awakening has nothing to do with not hurting. You got to really get this because we are profoundly conditioned genetically, cellularly, to avoid hurt, just like avoiding death, appropriately. Hurt, you don't want to hurt the body, you move. But that gets incorporated into our emotional body and gets incorporated into this kind of uh, withdrawal from the truth of who we are. And then a simulation of that in the mind. So an image of who we are, with memories of that image moving through time and experiences that happen to that image and feelings that happen to that image and hurts that happen to that image as a substitute for the reality that can experience and does experience everything including the most profound hurt including the most profound withdrawal separation, ignorance and enlightenment The truth of who you are is inclusive of all. Every body ever born will be born. Every thought ever born or will be born. Every emotion ever born or will be born. Every circumstance ever born or will be born. And present throughout it all. And since you already are the truth of who you are, you have a full capacity to recognize that. However you have thought of yourself, or imagined yourself, or experienced yourself, or whatever stories you have told yourself, you have full and complete capacity. Not to say that you will always feel the universe loves you or you will always feel you love the universe. That has nothing to do with feelings. It's much closer than any feeling. There are oceanic feelings and there are contracted feelings. There are feelings of pain in the body and there are feelings of the body being invisible, transparent. There are feelings of the mind being absolutely there recognition of the mind being absolutely silent and still and recognition of the mind being agitated and closer than all of that is the reality of who you are which has always been awake always the intellect is a beautiful power this human incarnation is a beautiful power. The problem is when the intellect or the human incarnation gets put as supreme. And the problem in that is that it's a lie. The supreme is beingness itself. And that in an individual we call heart. Because the heart corresponds to that or core. The opportunity is that one's life, one's brain, one's intellect is in perpetual bowing to that. 
is saying perpetually, mm -hmm. how can I be used by that? And then it is used by that. That's what I desire, that my life be used by that completely yes. and totally. It's, it's uh, my only I trust desire. this desire. This is a beautiful desire. Then you have to see, this is a very big desire. <laughs> this takes no prisoners, really. Because in that desire, you are surrendering the power to lie. So be aware, the lying keeps you quite protected. Seems to, that's one of its, its uh, purposes. You know, if you can lie your way out of it, you won't get killed. <laughs> So it's a power, it's a city. But to be free, these powers are given up, surrendered. So when you surrender your human beingness, your particular individual life to beingness itself, to truth itself, to have it, to live it, then you are giving up your power to lie. <laughs> yes, you know that. Oh, I needed to hear it. I needed <laughs> yes. to hear it after all of this. That's right. We need to hear it because, you know, we just think, oh. well, maybe we just keep a little of that power because oh. it might come in handy. Things could get rough. And, you know. <laughs> but that's the willingness. That's the biggest addiction is the power of mind. It's so seductive. To, yes. I, it's yes, because, whoa, what a display it has. It is quite seductive. It is quite powerful. And it generates extreme pleasure, extreme experiences of power and empowerment. But underneath it all is the misery of the lie. Oh, Gangaji, just that you're here to point to out tell the, truth. the fallacy of the power <laughs> of the mind. Okay, to tell the truth. Yeah, yes, it's that yes, simple, to tell yes. the truth. To tell the truth. This truth is available to everyone. Because this truth, the absolute truth, is who you are, already who you are. And the relative truth versus the relative lie is just the dance of dependence and independence around that. So in your willingness to be bare, to be exposed, in your willingness to see the lies of your life, and to see them as lies, not as investments that may work out in the end. If you just pray hard enough, or hope hard enough, or do something more enough, then it's over. You close the account. Close the account. Yes, yes. So the habits of of that may appear throughout your whole life, who knows? It's very skillful to assume that they will appear throughout your whole life so that you stop telling yourself this story of, oh, when will they disappear? Because that's just a deflection. So just assume that these habits are grooved into this human mind. So what? So what? If you're telling the truth, in this moment that addiction has no power whatsoever. Your responsibility in that is to tell the truth. My responsibility in that is to tell the truth. And then we see, we see what's next to be unveiled, revealed. Painful or pleasurable, it's irrelevant having to do with exposure of habit or having to do with deeper exposure of truth that has never been touched by any habit. Irrelevant. Whether your habits stop tomorrow and never appear again or whether your habits continue appearing until your last breath, irrelevant. What is relevant is telling the truth, being true to the truth. I needed this confirmation today. 
Thank you so much. This confirmation is always with you. We have the honor of meeting together like this today, but who knows what could happen tomorrow. This body could be destroyed, this body could be destroyed, this planet could be destroyed, who knows? You always, at every moment, have the capacity to tell the truth. All that's required is you give up the power of lying. And finally, you give it up for good. And sometimes telling the truth will feel like you are being ripped apart. And often it is not the politically correct move. And families can burst apart. And people can hate you for it or adore you for it. Either ways can be very threatening. But the allegiance to telling the truth This is the lifeline to truth. Investigate it and see. Yes, it can be tremendously scary. And relatively speaking, you can be wrong. But that's okay. That reveals itself too. At least you aren't hiding out because you might be wrong. You tell it like you see it and be willing to see deeper and then see. I speak a lot about stopping. You've heard me say stop. You've heard me say, my teacher invited me to stop. My teacher invites you to stop. The challenge is to stop. And really, that's all I have to say, but to communicate what that means is the challenge. That's why there are other words that follow. <laughs> because deep, deeply embedded in a human animal, and all animals are, all plants, is the power to escape, or to try to escape, that which is perceived to be harmful to the animal or the plant, to the being. So that's a makeup of a human being, this uh, capacity to escape, to get away from. And as you know, it's very valuable. It has its appropriate use. The dilemma, or the way it becomes a liability rather than an asset, is when it kicks in when something is beneficial and the escape mechanism kicks in, which you also know to some degree, because this usually happens when there is something unknown, and it can be something quite wonderful that is unknown, and the escape mechanism kicks in, and the mind gets busy about trying to get away from, like intimacy, like love, like success even, as it approaches. It's like, oh, I know this other that I'm trudging through, and the drudgery, the, the familiar drudgery of life, and there's something else approaching. And it just clicks into this escape mechanism. And that's when the, the teaching is to stop, to be still, to don't move. <laughs> 